If we get into an economic soft spot and our fiscal policy is not credible, or if we get this monetary policy cycle wrong, the next crisis in the United States could be in the sovereign markets uh, as opposed to in the corporate markets. On WealthTrack, leading global value investor Matt McLennan on where he is finding value in the U.S. markets. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. The debate raging on Wall Street is how much longer the Federal Reserve will continue its aggressive fight against inflation. The Fed's goal is ambitious, to get the inflation rate down to a long-term average of around 2%. Now, the Bears are taking Federal Reserve officials at their word, which has been a chorus of, we will stay the course. And as Chairman Jay Powell famously said in a speech last year, the Fed will keep at it until the job is done. And he has repeatedly warned that there would likely be some economic pain in the process. Well, the bulls are tracking the slowdown in a number of inflation indicators. For instance, December's consumer price index slowed for the sixth month in a row to a 6.5% annual rate versus a year ago. Wage growth is slowing. Gasoline prices have fallen from their highs. Despite protestations by Fed officials, a growing number of professional investors are betting that the Fed will actually cut rates in the second half of the year, which would be very positive for stocks and bonds. Today's guest is a leading global value manager who has a successful track record of investing in the U.S. and overseas. He is Matthew McLennan, co-head of the global value team at First Eagle Investments, where he oversees more than $80 billion in assets, including several mutual funds. His flagship First Eagle Global Fund is rated five-star by Morningstar with a bronze analyst rating for its unique approach, which has helped give the strategy a long-term edge. Since McLennan took over the fund from legendary value investor Jean-Marie Avillard in 2008, it has outperformed its Morningstar World Allocation category with considerably less volatility than the stock market. First Eagle is a sponsor of WealthTrack. McLennan's track record speaks for itself. I asked him how Fed policy figures into his assessment of valuations in the U.S. market. Well, the Fed in some ways is a source of imperfection at many moments and uh, a potential risk factor to consider. Uh, I know the intent of the Fed is to steer the economy back on a sustainable course, but for us as long-term business owners, we're very focused on uh, picking individual securities and uh, sometimes the Fed skews the economy in one direction or another. And, and to, to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, you know, I think one of the great challenges today is that there's not a real productivity story in the U.S. economy. So when the Fed added dramatic stimulus in the wake of COVID, uh, we got this burst of inflation. And uh, the Fed is now having to compensate fully in the other direction and lifting interest rates to a, a level that is higher than the prior cycle's peak level of interest rates. And when you have higher interest rates and higher debt, uh, you inadvertently risk a financial accident. So what I'm trying to say here is that the Fed has basically gone from missing inflation to the risk of potentially missing a financial accident. And so that's a top-down risk that we want to keep a wary eye on. So you were very aware and focused on the potential risks of when the Fed overstimulated. Now you're saying that it's the opposite issue. Are the risks higher now of some sort of a financial shock? than they were when, when it overstimulated? So, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting is if you look at the Fed's pattern of intervention over the last 20 or 30 years, each time we've had uh, a crisis, uh, the degree of intervention has grown in scale. Uh, so it, you remember back at the savings and loan crisis, we lowered interest rates a few hundred basis points, and then there was the uh, internet uh, bubble that burst and, and then uh, interest rates lower still, and then the global financial crisis uh, zero rates and QE, and then of course COVID, where they expanded money supply by uh, over 30% in addition to zero rates. And so what we've seen is this pattern of successively bigger um, reactions uh, from the central bank. And uh, what we saw on the other side, though, was an asymmetry. Over the last 20 years, every peak uh, in the interest rate was lower 
than the prior right. peak in the interest rate. Because as debt levels went up in the economy, uh, the economy was less able to withstand uh, interest rates going up. This peak is different. This peak, we're seeing higher interest rates on a higher level of debt. So I do, I do think the risk of some sort of financial accident uh, is going up. I think the Fed is uh, feeling its way uh, to where it thinks is the right place to let uh, interest rates uh, rest uh, as, a, as a sort of form of slowing the economy down. But invariably, when you have a high level of debt in the economy, it's hard to know when you've gone one step too far. So do you think that the Fed is close to going one step too far in tightening? So I, I think there's a risk that uh, that could happen. And I, I think what's happening here is not, not just the interest rates um, going up, but we've seen quite an amount of fiscal tightening in the United States. Um, yes. The budget deficit went from double digit levels as a percentage of GDP down to four to five percent of GDP. That's a really dramatic fiscal tightening. And uh, monetary and fiscal tightening tend to act with a lag uh, in the economy. What we have seen is that um, business expectations have moderated here uh, in the services sector and the manufacturing sector. And so I think that's signaling uh, a slowdown in nominal growth. What hasn't moderated as much is wage growth. And so right. I think what you see here is the emergent risk of a bit of a margin squeeze uh, for corporate America. You've told me in the past that you focus on the structural, structural elements in the market. So looking at the U.S. market, what are the structural elements that you are looking at that, are, that might be worrying you? I, look, I, I think the most worrying thing to me from a uh, five to 10 year standpoint is that we don't have much of a productivity story or a real growth story for the US economy. Mm -hmm. We have this aging workforce. And so um, for much of the last couple of decades, the workforce was growing at a percent or a little bit more. Now it's not really growing. Uh, we're seeing shrinking participation rates in the economy uh, over the long term, uh, less hours worked. And so that's a headwind to growth. Um, the second thing is that as we've seen a mixed shift to services uh, in the US economy, there's typically less productivity growth in services. We're also seeing the role of the government expand in the economy, which tends to be a bit of a headwind to productivity growth. And uh, on top of that, you know, we have a couple of other forces at work that have really uh, emerged in the last handful of years. One is the trend towards deglobalization. Right. And, um, you know, that's quite a headwind to productivity if it becomes more pervasive. And secondly, the um, energy transition that everyone's been talking about is not going to be cheap. Um, it, it, it's going to cost an enormous amount uh, to transition the capital stock uh, of the world's energy markets over the next generation. And so we have all of these potential headwinds to productivity. And the reason that's important uh, is that if the economy's productive capacity is not growing that quickly, um, every time you try to stimulate the economy, you risk inflation. Um, and so uh, while we might be coming off this um, demand surge that we saw and this wave of inflation that we saw, um, if we get this uh, slowdown and then we go back to the mode of stimulating, we could see another wave. And in fact, that was the pattern of the 1970s. Also, a lot of productivity issues. There were some energy shocks and we had these waves of inflation where we saw apparent improvement and then things got worse again. And over a decade, there was an adverse regime shift. And so low productivity growth raises the risk that we could have a regime shift to a bad decade. The Fed seems to be extremely hyper aware of the dangers that occurred uh, with inflation in the 70s, and they seem to be determined to avoid that. Do you think that the Fed is up to that job, or, or is it something really that's productivity is certainly out of their control? You know, this is the same Fed uh, that just a couple of years earlier expanded money supply by 30 percent right. um, and and essentially moved from, uh, you know, inflation rate targeting to average inflation rate into targeting. They, they let inflation happen. So I think we have to um, just be clear that the Fed is not uh, possessed of supernatural prescience and ability to fore foretell the future. And, and they're they're sort of struggling in the dark as well and, and um, unfortunately have a track record of some, some policy errors. Uh, but I wish them well in this journey to quell inflation. The first two little funds are highly rated by Morningstar. And the reason that I'm mentioning it is that in very challenging environments, uh, 
First Eagle's approach uh, really has much less risk than either your competitors or the market. And so you're, you're, you're able to kind of mitigate the downside risk. So just explain uh, kind of what your approach is and, and if it's changing at all, uh, ag again, in this new era that we have of higher inflation and tighter credit conditions. So th there's no change in our approach. I mean, True North for us is very clear. Uh, mm -hmm. we, you know, we really aspire to what we refer to as resilient wealth creation. And that is to sort of act almost more like business gardeners, you know, long-term investors uh, owning businesses with a decade horizon and trying to uh, identify companies uh, bottom up one at a time that are inherently resilient by virtue of their um, cash flow generating capacity. And usually that means the company has some kind of incumbent advantage. You know, they are, they're the leading company in a certain industry. Um, they have the ability, therefore, to generate superior uh, margins and free cash flows. Even if they're cyclical, uh, the ability to generate cash flow through a cycle helps make those individual companies resilient. And if you have the benefit of incumbency, uh, what that also affords you is the ability to hopefully grow at a measured pace over time. You can expand like a tree in concentric rings, if you will, around your core assets and market position. Our long horizon and our willingness to be diversified uh, acts as, on the one hand, a little bit of a shield against the unknown, but also by casting the net wide, investing in a wide array of different businesses, you also uh, expose yourself to opportunity. Uh, diversification uh, for us is actually uh, an important part of our strategy. And as, as you mentioned, uh, we have a willingness to uh, hold uh, a potential hedge in gold, and we can right. talk about that in more detail, uh, and a willingness not to force the cash to work if we don't see the right businesses at the right price. And so we have this uh, philosophy where cash is a residual of the opportunity set. What are some examples of a resilient uh, com US-based companies? So we have a wide array of, of different investments and, and um, some of them can be uh, quite stable and, mm -hmm. and cash flow um, generative as businesses, uh, albeit going through their own business cycles. And an example of a, a company that has some cyclicality, but it's, it's, it's somewhat muted, would be uh, our largest semiconductor investment in the United States, which is analog devices. Uh, what analog device does is it creates um, specialty uh, semiconductors that convert real world data uh, to digital data. And you can ah. imagine as we've gone from the computer and mobile computing to the internet of things and factory automation that um, there's an absolute proliferation of real world signals that need to get converted to digital signals um, in, in the broadening sort of web of electronics that we use in day to day life. And this company um, uh, is a leader uh, in the field, along with Texas Instruments, which we, we also own. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that's different about this business from many other semiconductor businesses is that often they have product lives that can last a decade or more. So you have many more layers of recurring revenue uh, in this business relative to um, a traditional semiconductor company that's on a, a much faster product cycle time. The industry itself is quite concentrated. Um, and so there's been an updrift to margins over the long term. And the management teams have thoughtfully returned capital to shareholders. Now, this business right now, uh, I would argue, is at above trend in terms of its profitability, like the economy more broadly. So there's, there's risks right. there. But if you're thinking about a business to own for the next decade, you know, to me, this is a good example of a company with a leading market position that's relevant to the future uh, and, it, and it trades at a rational valuation. So an, another uh, a company that you own, which is, is in a totally separate category that, that's very uh, you know, U.S. focused is in the healthcare, which is uh, HCA Healthcare. HCA is a, is a really terrific business. And I, I think it's a great example of what, where we see competitive advantage coming from um, in uh, the, the uh, economy of today where intangible assets are very important. Um, ultimately, in the hospital business, what matters is local market density of market position. So if you're the leading mm -hmm. hospital, and then you can surround that hospital with the leading physician network uh, and um, complementary ambulatory centers for you know, out of uh, hospital procedures or diagnostics, then you create this ecosystem that's quite stable and quite profitable. Uh -huh. The reason that's interesting um, is that the majority of hospitals in the United States aren't that profitable. There are a lot of non-for-profit yes. hospitals. 
But right. if you have um, a density of market position, you start to get economies of scale. You can offer more complex procedures at premium prices and you can earn better margins. So while the industry itself is not that profitable, HCA has been able to generate 20% uh, EBITDA margins in their business. Um, they have a long track record of focusing their business. Um, you have the history of the Frist family, and you know that we love family-run businesses at yes, First Eagle. Yes, you do, right. Um, they, they've been very thoughtful capital allocators. Um, and so you, you, know, you have a business that not only has this strong 16 key markets, but they're in growing uh, markets. They're in places like Nashville and Dallas-Fort Worth. You know, they're basically the sunbelt um, uh, footprint of hospitals. And, and so you have this combination of population growth, the ability to add uh, more complex services um, to your hospitals as you invest around it. You've had a business here that's had the ability to grow uh, over, over time and generate free cash flow. They also have a track record of having bought back a lot of stock. And so, um, you know, HCA Healthcare is one of our largest positions and um, uh, it's been a really well-run business that's very cash flow generative and, and sort of fits the, the First Eagle mold. We were talking about the fact that First Eagle is known for holding a position in gold. Uh, a lot of other portfolio managers, instead of holding you know, gold as a kind of a, a diversifier, uh, they are holding treasuries instead. How do you compare the two? It's a great question, uh, uh, Consuelo. And, and ultimately, gold is a monetary alternative, if you will, that's that's truly international in nature and uh, stateless, and it and it and it doesn't represent a debt per se. Uh, but having said that, you know when we look at how gold has traded over the long term, it does tend to move up when real interest rates go down, and and move down when real interest rates go up. And so, um, if you'd looked at the price of gold um, and compared it to say the iShares 20 year plus Treasury ETF. Uh, from 2015 to 2021, um, both gold and treasuries traded pretty similarly. They went up mm. and down largely together when real ex interest rate expectations uh, were going up and down. But something happened in 2022, uh, and this is important. Um, after we sanctioned the ability of the Russians to access their treasury reserves, the price of gold and the price of treasuries started uh, pursuing different paths. Directionally, they were moving up and down together, but the price of gold was far more resilient than treasuries. And so mm. over 2022, the dollar went up and real interest rates went up. If you just knew those two things, you would have thought that gold prices went down quite a bit, but they were actually flat. And they were flat in an environment where the long dated treasury ETF that I just referenced was down over 30%. That's an incredible right. price difference. And, um, you know, I, I think sometimes when you see a, uh, a price difference of that nature, um, there's an information uh, content in that. And, what, and we've been trying to sort of explore why is it that gold performs so much better than treasuries as a potential mm -hmm. hedge in 2022? And we think it's linked to the fact that the U.S. brought the reserve value of the currency into question when they sanctioned the ability to access those reserves. We've seen foreign central banks more than double um, the pace of, uh, the, at which they're buying gold in 2022 uh, as of the, the third quarter. And so uh, the dynamic uh, in the gold market has changed quite a bit versus treasuries. And I think this is a warning signal, um, just like the UK got into trouble with Liz Truss over the summer uh, when the gilt market blew out in yields. This is a warning signal that if we get into an economic soft spot and our fiscal policy is not credible, uh, or if we get this monetary policy cycle wrong, um, that uh, you know the, the next crisis in the United States could be in the sovereign markets uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to in the corporate markets. If, if central banks were buying gold, were they selling treasuries or were they not buying as many treasuries? We'll only know this with a lag because the, the disclosure of these things is, is not that great. But uh, if you don't buy treasuries, uh, they, they run off your portfolio. Uh, and so it's quite possible, you know, if you look at the structure of currency reserves, say roughly 60% of currency reserves are in dollars. It's quite possible that economies like China or Russia or Saudi Arabia uh, are looking to diversify away from dollar reserves. And so um, this is something that I think just uh, bears keeping a close eye on because the Federal Reserve is shrinking its balance sheet of treasuries. 
So uh, let me just ask you one more follow-up question. The fact when you mentioned uh, other countries basically looking for alternatives to treasuries, they've been talking about that. That's been a threat uh, for you know for several decades. I mean, a lot of people have been talking about that. That China, you know, China would love and Russia would love to replace uh, basically the dollar as the reserve currency of the world with something else. Um, but you know, how, how much more real do you think the threat is to the credibility of, of treasuries today than it has been in the past uh, as far as looking at treasuries as kind of, you know, the, the safe haven uh, when uh, there are, you know, bigger problems uh, in the global economy or the financial system? Currency has always been a relative beauty contest where there's been a lot of ugly ducklings. Uh, and I think that's been part of the problem to uh, these uh, central banks diversifying their reserves. Um, mm -hmm. it, but I will say that the behavior is different in 2022. The rate at which central banks are purchasing gold um, is different uh, from what it has been. And so that's why I think it, it, it bears watching. The other thing I would just mention is that the dollar uh, was strong for the first nine months of 2022, but it started to right. weaken. Um, and it's interesting that even though interest rate expectations only moderated slightly in the United States, we saw some pretty sharp negative reactions in the foreign exchange market. So the yen appreciated quite a bit versus the dollar in the fourth quarter of last year. So to the euro and gold even more. So uh, what we're seeing here is that the United States as an economy runs a substantial trade deficit. It needs to attract foreign capital. But if other countries feel that they're already pretty fully stocked uh, on the dollar and the interest rate differential story starts to go away because the bond market's thinking that the Fed's already done enough, um, then the question of the currency uh, becomes, I think, more important. And the dollar was really at a generational high versus many currency crosses. And so I think uh, one has to be open minded to the possibility that we we go through a period of a weaker dollar, uh, whether or not it happens in a, in a neat and linear fashion. Who knows? But I think the dollar has been very strong for quite a while. And some of the pillars of that uh, investment thesis may be coming into question right now. And Matt, if there's uh, one investment, we always ask this question uh, at the end of every interview, if there's one investment that we should all own some of, what would it be? What would your recommendation be? Uh, again, this is for a long term diversified portfolio. So look, I, I mean, I think we had a good discussion about HCA Healthcare. I think it's a great investment to own for the long term. And I think if you wanted to own something um, potentially a little bit more eclectic and different, you know, one of the, one of the risks that we talked about uh, in the world was this risk of the re-domiciling of factory capacity. And so one of the investments we have in our portfolio is a company that's in a very niche industry. It is the leader in fiber lasers. Now, fiber lasers are critical for automated factories, for cutting and welding. And um, they're much more efficient than uh, traditional CO2 lasers. Um, IPG Photonics has about 65% market share of the fiber laser market. And this is a company that has net cash um, and is buying back stock and has been through quite a, a big down cycle because its end markets, not just the United States, uh, it has business in China that was impacted by the, the COVID lockdowns and the problems in China. So if China's reopening and the rest of the world uh, needs to automate its factories. Uh, you know, we think the world's going to need more fiber lasers long term. And this company um, has a near monopoly position in that industry and sensible capital allocation. And so sometimes an eclectic company like this, if held for the long term as part of a diversified portfolio, can have cycles to it that can uh, make a meaningful difference over the next five to 10 years. So IPG Photonics, I mean, you know, it certainly is not a household name, and it just it speaks to the companies that First Eagle has a tendency to find that most of us have never heard of, but uh, turns out to have some uh, absolutely uh, essential services or, or capabilities. So Matt McLennan, First Eagle, thanks so much for joining us and talking about the U.S. market, and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is identify the ballast, the stabilizer in your portfolio. 
As we just discussed with Matt McLennan, First Eagle has always had a core position in gold bullion for stability. It certainly provided protection in 2022 and limited the decline in the global value portfolio, helping it fall far less than its benchmark and peers. Well, gold is much easier for individuals to own than it has ever been in the past through ETFs like the Spider Gold Trust or iShares Gold Trust. As risk expert, the late great Peter Bernstein, author of Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk, told us on WealthTrack many years ago, gold is like having an insurance policy against disaster. Even a small amount can provide some protection in market meltdowns. Next week, we investigate opportunities in international markets in part two of our interview with Matt McLennan. In this week's extra feature, McLennan recommends a book that puts today's divisive political atmosphere in historical perspective. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Have a lovely weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.